What's up guys, welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Riddell and in today's video we cover a game which really shows the flexibility that the Hippopotamus system gives a player and how you can't waste time against it. It may look passive, but if you're not careful, you're gonna see a hippo running 30 miles an hour at you and it ain't gonna stop. Now this game was played by Serbian Grandmaster Lausic and here he started off with a modern defense against e4 by playing g6, v and shadowing that bishop and then here continuing with d6 followed by knight d7. Here white continues with bishop c4 and against e6, bishop g5. White making it very clear that they're trying to play aggressive and attacking chess. But again, notice there's not really much white can do from stopping us from achieving our normal hippo setup. Guys, with the hippo, we're trying to put our central pawns on e6 and d6, tucking these knights right behind. And on top of that, fianchettoing our bishop on g7, which we've already done, and then eventually also fianchettoing our bishop on b7, putting our pawns on a6, h6, or both. Now here we see why I continue with bishop b3, and now black continue with the normal hippo of h6. We're getting a normal hippo setup, but we're actually getting tempo against this bishop. And I'm not going to lie, this next move from white is a little bit confusing for me. Bishop c1. White plays bishop g5, allows us to get development and this h6 move, which we're going to do anyways. And white has done nothing, but really just waste two moves. Going back, I'm assuming white didn't want to play a move like bishop h4 or bishop back to f4 because we could play g5 eventually, gaining another tempo against that bishop. And maybe against bishop e3, we could eventually, we don't have to play it right now, but we could eventually play d5, right? I mean, attacking this light sword pawn. Whole idea being if this pawn pushes up, we can then play knight f5 again attacking that bishop. However, as I mentioned, I am a little bit confused on why white decided to go to g5 and then all the way back to c1. However, guys, going back to this position in which white went back to this square, giving black a little bit extra development, we see black just continue to develop with castle and kingside, and then by playing b6 and fee and shadowing this bishop on b7. Here, white continues with knight bd2, and now a very interesting idea from black, that being this move king h8. My guess is that at this point in the game, Laos was really wanting to play e5 and f5, almost in king's Indian defense type fashion, trying to gain some space on the king side of the board. But obviously we can't play e5 and f5 with this bishop on b3, as these pawns would be pinned to the king on g8. I mean, if we play e5 first, this pawn on f7 is gonna be pinned. And if we play f5 right now, we're simply gonna lose the pawn on e6. More normal ideas in the hippopotamus defense include ideas like c5 in this position trying to put pressure on d4 and on top of that playing a move like g5 and knight g6 as well as b5 and knight b6. On top of that we could always play a move like d5 or e5 expanding in the center and giving some of our pieces some potential activity. But here we see king h8 again I believe trying to give these central pawns some freedom to push on e5 and f5. We now see h3 and now black continuing with knight g8. Somewhat of a strange looking move, but I think here he's looking ahead. He realizes that he has quite a bit of time. White isn't as developed as they usually are, and these very next moves, he's now able to continue with e5 and then play f5. Now with a knight on g8, which isn't in the way of this queen on d8 and can easily play knight f6 at a moment's notice. Here white decides to capture both of the pawns on e5 and f5, starting off by taking off the central pawn and then taking off the flank pawn. And I think that this is a decent strategy from white, but also a very dangerous one. In one sense, these pawns are weaknesses that white can go after. In fact, the very next move, white plays knight c4. At the same time, these pawns are giving us space and they're really trying to wipe out this fourth rank. So white has to be very careful. We see this move knight c4, white here trying to threaten to capture the pawn on e5, but we don't want to lose our pawn. So we see Laos continue by e4, simply expanding in the center, attacking that minor piece. And now against knight d4, continuing to activate the pieces with knight c5. Now this knight c5 move actually does a couple things. Before this, white was threatening to play knight e6, a key square attacking our queen and our rook. And here we would have simply went down the exchange. So we see knight c5, which defends the key square of e6, and on top of that, attacks this bishop on b3 and the key square of d3 as well. So I like this move. This knight c5 option is really doing a bunch of good things for us right now. We see white continue by dropping this bishop back to c2, not allowing any kind of knight takes b3 ideas, and also defending that d3 square. And here from black, we see queen h4. I mean, just throwing this queen into the action on the king side, putting a ton of pressure 
on the white camp, specifically the area around this king on G1, which currently doesn't have a ton of defenders. We saw this move B4 in the game, which I actually think is the best move. Let's say white plays a move here like queen E2, just trying to hold on, trying to get this king some reinforcement. Well, we're just going to continue with rook A, E8, and these rooks are locked and loaded towards this queen on E2. And also on this F file, we can now continue with ideas like F4 potentially trying to break through with E3 or F3. We obviously have two very active bishops on G7 and B7. This knight on C5 is also very active. This queen speaks for itself. And this knight on G8 is our one piece that is a little bit inactive, but we can get this piece involved in a moment's notice. So long story short, I mean, with our current space advantage and the activity of our pieces and potential F4, F3, E3 ideas, white cannot just sit around and try to hang on. They got to play a move like B4, which is exactly what we see. And notice here, guys, if we play a move like knight D7, I mean, this just seems like the obvious option, but now white is able to, again, take control of that key e6 square playing knight e6 attacking the bishop and the pawn on c7 as well as this knight on d7 our best move here is rook f7 for black and even then here with the activity of this knight and this queen really coming down on this knight on d7 i'm taking white here any day of the week so guys against this move b4 we see Lodge not want to give up this square of e6 so we see this very creative option of rook a d8 whole idea being if white takes on c5 which is what happened in the game we're simply going to take back and this knight cannot move unless of course white wants to lose their queen on d1 so here we see white continue with bishop b2 in which case we're simply able to capture back and then continue putting the pressure on that central pawn with c5 and i understand here that white didn't want to just allow black to take on d4 so we see this move d5 but this also gives black a ton of activity as we're simply able to just take that bishop off the board and then snatch off that pawn now going up upon a material and attacking this queen and against queen e2 getting this knight on g8 involved with knight f6 again we have a very nice space advantage a queen on h4 which is not going anywhere anytime soon i mean a move like g3 obviously can't be played for a multitude of reasons the number one being that we can just win that pawn on h3 and we're definitely in the driver's seat here white tries to create some counterplay with bishop b3 but guys in chess we always have to ask ourselves okay where would i like this rook on t5 to go it's currently being attacked where can i put this rook to put more pressure on this king on g1 well the answer is this square on g7 so okay let's get our rook there rook d7 slide this rook over to g7 currently threatening queen takes h3 as his pawn is pinned so we see bishop takes f5 stopping this threat but now from black queen g5 i mean just dropping this queen back and now actually making two threats we're first off threatening to just win a piece but if this bishop just goes back to e6 we're simply going to have a mate in one so white is practically forced to play this move bishop g4 but we're now able to play h5 again attacking this bishop and this bishop cannot move to a square like e6 unless they want to lose that game in one move so here we see f4 a desperation attempt from white trying to somehow get back in this game there's a ton of different ways that black can win here in fact we could just use the world on passant and take on f3 and have a clearly better game but here we see the very simple idea of queen g6 bringing this queen back and keeping scope of that pawn on g2 here white is able to play bishop e6 because this is no longer a mate and now from black the brilliant move e3 pushing up this pawn which does attack the square of f2 but more importantly it gets this bishop involved and guys this is one of my favorite things about the hippo by having both over bishop being shadowed oftentimes it's only going to take one pawn move two pawn moves a piece getting out of the way and we're going to have an aggressive and attacking piece coming out of nowhere we are attacking this pawn and there's just no way for white to hold on to it we see knight c4 and here black could have taken on g2 with the queen i mean even this is winning whole idea being after queen takes and rook takes surprisingly king h1 is the best idea for white even though it runs into this long diagonal because if a move like king f1 we now have this key idea of knight g4 which threatens a mate in one in two different ways and i mean there's just no way that white's going to be able to stop both without giving up a ton of material this game is practically over but here, guys, black does not take on g2, but instead just continues the very simple idea of queen e4. Whole idea being we'd rather take with our rook first instead of our queen. Notice here how white cannot really defend the pawn on g2 without playing knight takes e3, in which case we're simply just going to take this bishop right off the board and continue adding the pressure. And here white actually resigned the game. I mean, if white decides to push the pawn with a move like g4, it may seem like for a second they're okay. But guys, this move queen h1 shows that this e3 move pays off and this game would have been a game over.
Thanks for watching today's video. If you'd like to learn the theory behind the hippopotamus defense, click that video to the left. If you'd like to see arguably one of the greatest hippo defense games of all time by Anthony Miles, click that video to the right. Leave a comment down below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.